Lenin as economist of production, a Ricardian step backwards. By Paul Zarembka. Abstract. Lenin presents his economics as the embodiment of Marxist theory, yet Lenin's economic writings contain considerable shortcomings. Indeed, the pattern of these shortcomings suggests that Lenin was an economist of production in the sense used by Marx in describing Ricardo. Ricardo's conception, according to Marx, is, quote, in the interest of the industrial bourgeoisie only because, insofar as the industrial bourgeoisie's interests coincide with that of production or the productive development of human labor, and quote, Marx. Lenin, when exhibiting a similar conception, is taking a step backwards. Lenin fails to address coercion in market expansion, utilizing instead a classical conception and in the process ignoring the Russian commune. Lenin's criticism of Ricardo is limited, in contrast with Lenin's biting attack against Sismondi for misunderstanding accumulation in capitalist society. Lenin also distorts Marx in emphasizing disproportionalities in production in his crisis theory. Finally, Lenin's interpretation of, quote, accumulation of capital, end quote, mistakenly refers to increasing production. End of abstract. Georgi Plekhanov and a few other Russians formed the Emancipation of Labor Emigre Group in Geneva in 1883, the same year Marx died. For the Emancipation of Labor Emigre Group's decade, Plekhanov's group, sorry, for its first decade, Plekhanov's group, like uh, the Emancipation of Labor Emigre Group, basically represented the only Russian Marxist current, although in exile. Plekhanov had been a populist and moved to Marxism in the early 1880s, including translating the Communist Manifesto into Russian in 1882 with a foreword by Marx. His 1884 book, Our Differences, established Plekhanov's theoretical break from Narodism, Russian populism, our Differences is mainly an attack on the Narodnik position that capitalism is impossible in Russia, since capitalism impoverishes the rural population and thus undermines its own need for markets. Plekhanov counters this line of argument with an empirical analysis of Russia and other historical examples. The work is not one of theoretical abstraction. Although Plekhanov did study and use Zeber's 1871 work. Footnote. Volume 2 of Capital was to appear only in the next year, 1885, with Volume 3 appearing in 1894, and Plekhanov, in any case, never showed great interest in abstract political economy. And footnote. From the late 1880s, Plekhanov had contact with Engels until Engels' death in 1895. In subsequent years, Plekhanov held an authoritative role within, the, within Marxism, second only to Karl Kautsky. It was Plekhanov who promoted the concept, quote, dialectical materialism, end quote, and Plekhanov had a decisive influence on Lenin. Lenin was attracted to Marxism around 1889, following by a couple of years Lenin's brother's 1887 execution for his role in attempting to assassinate the Tsar. Lenin's brother had a favorable impression of Plekhanov's book, had read Capital in 1885, and had a little later joined an economic study group in which some members took a Marxist approach. Lenin knew of his brother's interest in Marx. By 1892, Lenin subscribed to Plekhanov's position on Narodism, and in 1895, his St. Petersburg League of Struggle for the Emancipation of the Working Class was formed. Lenin emphasized, excuse me, Lenin emphasizes and re-emphasizes his claim that his economics is the Marxist theory, although theories of surplus value 
and some other works of Marx were unpublished when Lenin was writing in the 1890s. Is Lenin correct? Contemporaries such as Karl Kautsky, Rosa Luxemburg, Nikolai Bukharin, and Henrik Grossman did not take on Lenin's economic theory either before or after 1917. Footnote. For example, Luxemburg's Accumulation of Capital, published in 1913, has separate chapters on Sismondi, McCulloch, Ricardo, Say, and Malthus, and has still other chapters on the Russian, quote, legal Marxist, end quote, whom, analyzed had, whom Lenin had analyzed in a number of his works. In retrospect, Luxembourg's omission of Lenin seems unfortunate. Given Luxembourg's willingness to have strong disagreements with Lenin on political matters, the reason for this omission could hardly have been lack of courage. End footnote. The first of Lenin's important economic works was unpublished, and others were only in the Russian original. This can somewhat explain the lack of attention. Lenin's own critical readings of Luxembourg and Bukharin could have stimulated controversy, but were left uncompleted in the form of marginal notes. Footnote. For, margin, for Lenin's marginal notes on Luxembourg's accumulation of capital, See the translation by James Lawler in Zarembka, 2000. On Bukharin's Economics of the Transformation Period, see Bukharin, 1920. End footnote. Lenin did write favorable reviews of some of Kautsky's work, to which Kautsky naturally did not object. Later, Stalinism would not countenance the idea of critical work on Lenin's economics. In the 1950s, Roman Rozdolsky wrote his well-known work on Marxist theory and did include important commentary on some of Lenin's economics. However, this only first appeared in print in 1968, in German. Thus, in the late 1960s, the influential theorist Louis Althusser could still, without counter-argument from others, describe Lenin's development of capitalism in Russia as the, quote, only work of scientific sociology in the world, end quote, and refer to Lenin's studies of Capital Volume 2 as, quote, text of gripping clarity and rigor, end quote. Althusser does not appear to have studied Lenin's economics very deeply. Two decades later, Desai could not, 1989, could not report any overall study of Lenin's economics motivated by his dearth of serious work on Lenin as an economist. He offered a collection of Lenin's economic writings, both theoretical and practical, along with an annotated listing of 133 pieces. Harding, um, 1977, I believe he published a book like the political, I think Harding, it's Neil Harding, and I believe it's... Uh, Lenin's political thought. Yeah, it's called Lenin's political thought. Yeah. Harding in 1977 did signal the importance of Lenin's economic writing for understanding Lenin's politics, particularly development of capitalism in Russia and imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, both of which are mainly empirical. In this, study, in this article, I query Lenin's principal theoretical work with specific attention to its conceptual underpinnings. My focus on theory should not be taken to mean that examining and drawing conclusions from Lenin's concrete analyses of Russia and the Soviet Union, and his specific policy recommendations for the latter, are unimportant. Footnote. Empirically oriented studies that contain useful observations, e.g. Milios, 1999, would nevertheless benefit from greater theoretical clarity before reaching positive assessments of Lenin on economic development. End footnote. Proceeding chronologically through his works and examining both what is there and some areas that are omitted, I find considerable shortcomings compared to Marx's work, sufficiently so and with such a pattern as to suggest that Lenin is taking a step backwards to an economics of production 
a la Ricardo. The relevant theoretical work centers on issues of market expansion, possible overproduction, and economic crises, leading up to the development of capitalism in Russia, then a few pieces in 1913 to 1915, including a theoretical summary of value theory and the accumulation of capital. I do not consider imperialism to be a theoretical piece. Um, yeah. I do not consider the book Imperialism to be a theoretical piece, even though imperialism attempts a rather grand statement about a highest stage of capitalism. To grasp the concept, quote, economist of production, end quote, recall the wage labor, that the wage labor in capitalism produces an amount in excess of his slash her wages and is therefore involved in overproduction. The capitalist is also engaging in overproduction, as the motivation of capital is other than enjoyment of use values. Indeed, quote, the industrial capitalist becomes more or less unable to fulfill the industrial capitalist function as soon as the industrial capitalist wants the accumulation of pleasures instead of the pleasure of accumulation, end quote. Marx. The capitalist mode of production generates overwhelming attention to production. Capitalism itself thus impels economists to focus on production. Smithian political economy says Marx is correct insofar as, one, excuse me, quote, one. I believe this is a quote. I don't know, it's like a block, so I guess it's a quote. Quote, one, capital, and hence the capitalist, capital's personification, is treated only as an agent for the development of productive forces and of production. Two, Smithian political economy expresses the standpoint of emerging capitalist society, to which what matters is exchange value, not use value, wealth, not enjoyment. The enjoyment of wealth seems to it a superfluous luxury. Until it itself learns to combine exploitation and consumption, and to subordinate itself to the enjoyment of wealth. Marx. Ricardo is, in fact, the, quote, economist of production par excellence, end quote. Opposing the squandering of wealth and luxury consumption, quote, Ricardo's conception is, on the whole, in the interest of the industrial bourgeoisie, only because, and insofar as, the industrial bourgeoisie's interests coincide with that of production or the productive development of human labor, end quote. The focus on capitalist practice as promotion of production makes Ricardo the quintessential classical political economist, and Marx certainly considered Ricardo the highest representative of classical political economy. Marx himself cannot be considered a political economist of production, but of, and this is in italics, the class relations in production and of the exploitation of the working class by the capitalist class. And um, italics. Capital, the book, is not about things nor about relations among owners of means of production, but rather about a social relationship between classes. Capital is written from the standpoint of the class doing the material production and yet exploited in production. Capital is not written from the standpoint of the class dominating the capitalist mode of production. This mode of production in which both classes engage in overproduction, albeit of different kinds, has a calling card imprinted with its mesmerizing, seductive, cold blue charmer, development of the productive forces. Let me see when this piece is written. This is from fall 2003. Where am I? Mm. One. Technological change leads to market expansion. Coercion is neglected. 
1893, Lenin was in St. Petersburg and prepared a paper for a study group entitled On the So-Called Market Question. This first surviving work in economic theory it was not published until 1937. In a certain sense, on the so-called market question, fill the theoretical gap in Plekhanov's R differences. To address the question whether sufficient markets obtained for capitalist development in Russia, a topic that will receive his attention through the end of the century, Lenin begins by laying out Marx's schemes of reproduction from the final chapter of Capital, Volume 2. Lenin notes that the reproduction schemes do not themselves establish the predominance of one sector slash department of a capitalist economy over another, and the departments producing constant capital and consumption goods develop in parallel in the schemes. Nevertheless, since there is a gradual increase in the organic composition of capital, constant over variable capital, Marx had, quote, proved, end quote, this in volume one, the production of means of production does indeed increase faster than the production of means of consumption. This conclusion is said to follow, quote, directly from the generally known proposition that capitalist production attains an immensely higher technical level than production in previous times, end quote. Lenin. Several years later, Lenin eliminates reference to any limitation of Marx's schemes and now simply claims incorrectly that Volume 2 itself establishes the predominance of the department producing means of production. Quote, realization is due more to means of production than to articles of consumption. This is obvious from Marx's schemes, end quote. Lenin. There was a footnote that I missed. Marx had indeed argued for an increase in the composition of capital, while also making it clear that the increase of value composition, or constant capital divided by variable capital, being measured in value, is much less than the related physical categories. Even so, this is not the only possibility. Marx also has a rather long express exposition in which the organic composition of count is described as possibly moving downward. I believe that, I'm not exactly sure, but I believe that passage um, that uh, Zarembka is uh, referring to um, is the basis for um, people such as Michael Heinrich um, viewing um, the so-called tendency of the rate of profit to fall with a great deal of skepticism. Especially in its catastrophist form. Anyway, end of footnote. Lenin's 1893 work then describes the historical development of capitalism as having two important features. First, the natural economy of direct producers is transformed into commodity economy due to the appearance of a social division of labor. Then the transformation of the commodity economy into capitalist economy proceeds as human labor power becomes a commodity. The latter arises from the quote fact that separate producers, each producing commodities on his own for the market, enter into competition with one another, each strives to sell at the highest price and to buy at the lowest. A necessary result of which is that the strong become stronger and the weak go under, a minority are enriched and the masses are ruined, end quote. Lenin. In other words, the social division of labor drives the formation of commodity, a commodity economy. Competition engendered by commodification drives class differentiation, and, in turn, the commodification of labor power. In Development of Capitalism in Russia, Lenin later affirms his argument that, quote, the progressive growth in the social division of labor is the chief factor in the process of creating a home market for capitalism, end quote. 
Since Volume 3 of Capital had now been published, Lenin is able to tie his position to Marx by pulling out a quote and aside to the discussion of ground rent, in which Marx refers to all those branches of production and products where commodity production and capitalist production prevail, and says that the market for commodities, quote, develop, this is in italics, quote, develops through the social division of labor. The division of productive labors mutually transforms their respective products into commodities, into equivalents for each other, making them mutually serve as markets, end quote. Sorry, there was, there was some confusion there. That quote's from Marx, but the italics are the emphasis is by Lenin. In this passage, Marx makes no connection to changing composition of capital, predominance of the means of production department over the means of consumption department, or technical improvements in capitalism. Regarding competition driving class differentiation, Marx had actually placed understanding competition outside his immediate purview, although, quote, the laws imminent in capitalist production manifest themselves in the movements of individual masses of capital, where they assert themselves as coercive laws of competition, dot, dot, dot. A scientific analysis of competition is not possible before we have a conception of the inner nature of capital. End quote. Marx. <clears throat> that's uh, 1867, so that must be Capital Volume 1. That is, Marx developed a class based theory rather than an understanding focused on individuals. Nevertheless, competition is not completely absent in Marx's work. To better understand the topic at hand, the production of relative surplus value, Marx goes on to describe adoption of technical change by individual capitalists as earning extra surplus value until the new technology becomes generalized through the competition resulting from the law of the determination of value by labor time. So that the reader does not think that competition itself drives technical change, Marx adds that, quote, the object of all development of the productiveness of labor within the limits of capitalist production is to shorten that part of the working day during which the workman must labor for his own benefit, end quote. We can conclude that, end quote, Marx, we can conclude that Marx is bringing competition forward in an individualistic manner in a way that Marx had not done, using it in turn to explain class differentiation. This is just a side note for me. I disagree with this notion that uh, Zorumka says about Marx, um, um, that the reader does not think about competition itself, think that competition itself drives technical change. Um, that seems uh, quite ridiculous because uh, the socially necessary labor time is established uh, not in, is can only be realized as social, not just the necessary time in a particular firm, um, via the market, um, and the idea of the techni technical changes that result in relative surplus value um, are to undermine that socially necessary uh, labor time manifested in price established on the market. So what technical change is seeking to do is that technical change is that um, is to undermine competition, undermine the socially undermine or um, have have one's individual necessary labor time beneath that of the socially necessary labor time. Um, the object of that is to for a while to get super profits. Um, what drives and if you read like uh, Ellen Mixon's Wood, 
and Robert Brenner and other people like that, but they'll tell you, I believe, I mean, I haven't looked at their work in some time, but from what I remember is that um, what fundamentally drives like the agricultural revolution in England is the fact of uh, farms no longer producing for self-subsistence, but being uh, market dependent, facing market imperatives. Market imperatives drive them to improve the land, and if they don't improve the land, they're operating... Um, uh, they're going to be forced out of the market by uh, ceasing to be able to provide a competitive price uh, for their goods. Um, and that continues to be a thing today. I mean, if you try to, uh, if you're a farmer and you're an independent farmer and you're, and you're trying to compete with agribusiness that has um, vast quantities of tools uh, at their disposal, um, the competition that you fail to, uh, com the, the competition that you fail at, um, as an independent, as a farmer, um, sorry, may making that up. Basically, competition definitely is what drives technical change. And fair, and, um, failing to, uh, keep up with technical change will drive you out of the market. Will drive firms out of the market. Anyway, back to the text. Just like a thought thing. I was just like, yeah, that's, I don't agree with that. Um, we can conclude that Lenin is bringing competition forward in an individualistic manner, in a way that Marx had not done, and using competition in turn to explain class differentiation. In his 1893 work, Lenin develops an early version of an input-output table in part to show that proletarianization of peasants creates a home market. This is an important accomplishment as it shows that capitalism can penetrate other forms of production and expand commodification and markets. Yet Lenin's subsequent discussion of how this penetration is driven is less than convincing and fails to account for coercion. Indeed, Perelman has drawn attention to the affinity between Lenin's and Adam Smith's analyses of primitive accumulation. Both Adam Smith and Lenin believe that pre-capitalist economies naturally dissolve into capitalism through market forces. Perelman's own argument, carefully discussing Stewart and Wakefield, is that the discussion of pre-capitalist economies is anything but a natural one, and that force is required. This author has not found any references by Lenin to either Stuart or Wakefield even though the last chapter of Capital, Volume 1, would have introduced Wakefield to all readers of Marx's work. Simul similarly, Torchetto, in 2000, has noted Marx's emphasis for 18th century England on coercive non-economic methods predominating in the formation of wage labor, and notes that the history of merchant capital was bloody. More generally, Torchetto says the theory of primitive accumulation in volume one is quote a long way from classical economics and especially from smith's idea of the evolution of society through the progressive development of the division of labor and the consequent expansion of trade end quote rather than focusing on coercion to create commodity production lenin says that the extent of the market is quote inseparably connected with the degree of specialization of social labor end quote and that, quote, this specialization, by its very nature, is as infinite as technical development. T t technical developments, end quote. Footnote. A couple years later, Lenin refers favorably to Struva's comment, quote, <clears throat> 
when the producers start working for a distant and indefinite, not a local exactly delimited market and competition, the struggle for a market develops, these conditions lead to technical progress, end quote. The or end footnote. The argument is sustained using carriage building in the United States in example, as an example, compared to Russia, asserting that the market, quote, arises where, and to the extent that, social division of labor and commodity production appear, end quote. Lenin believes he can characterize as erroneous the assertion that, quote, the growth of the market in capitalist society caused by the specialization of social labor must cease as soon as all natural producers become commodity producers. Russian carriage building has long become commodity production. So, I mean, Russian carriage building has long become commodity production. But wheel rims, say, are still made in every carriage builder's mm -hmm. or wheelwright's shop. The technical level is low. Production is split up among a mass of producers, end quote. Lenin. The U.S. example is not so cogent as Lenin presents. For example, should that firm which is putting together the whole wheel buy out the firms supplying it with separate parts, an example of centralization of capital, the produced parts would no longer be commodities as they would be part of the detailed work within one firm. But even disregarding this small point about vertical integration, there is an underlying weakness in reasoning that distinct firms making distinct parts for sale necessarily represents a real extension of the market rather than an artificial or practical extension of the market. Lenin concludes that, quote, technical progress must entail the specialization of different parts of production, their socialization, and consequently, the expansion of the market, end quote. Yet there is no theory of technical change to support this assertion, or at least no theory beyond saying that competition drives the need for cost reductions. Lenin does not here or elsewhere use Marx's production of relative surplus value for his own theoretical work, or, for that matter, for any of his empirical work. Marx had argued that technical change is focused on cheapening labor power, on cheapening the goods consumed by workers with their wages. Only once does Lenin in any of his work even refer to, quote, relative surplus value, end quote, and then only in providing a summary of volume one of capital. Uh, this is a side note. Um seems like this formulation is kind of awkward in my in my personal opinion um relative surplus value um seems in my to my memory uh this is um technical change um is focused on cheapening labor power on cheapening the goods consumed by workers with their wages that seem that is indirectly true Right. So, for instance, if you're a capitalist and you uh, pursue relative surplus value uh, by, uh, quote, rationalizing uh, your uh, labor process and thus making the inputs labor, uh, you purchase less labor to produce the same shit, um, you produce cheaper uh, inputs, blah, 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 blah. I guess that's not all focused on um, relative surplus value. But the idea, my understanding of it, um, seems to be that relative surplus value production is indirectly achieved via the um, desire for super profits among uh, producers who make the inputs, who make the consumer goods that the working class buys, right? So, like, um, That the but the idea of like say like a food manufacturer like an agro farm right um, doesn't try to make uh, food cheaper because 
they want to make the goods consumed by workers cheaper, right? In fact, in some instances, they um, try to secure monopolies via um, the state in order to um, keep artificially keep up the price of their products um, compared to uh, competitors from uh, across state lines or across borders. Um, their, uh, their purpose is to um, uh, out-compete and expand their market share, either uh, garnering super profits in the form of just like uh, producing um, <coughs> in terms of making super profits at a point, they can either do that or they can expand their profit, their market share, uh, or they can do a combination of both. There's no absolute distinction between the two. Um, that is how the goods that, um, so indirectly when those industries that produce consumer goods, um, improve their technical process, improve or cheapen their, uh, labor process, um, in order to be more competitive, that as a side effect, not directly, uh, planned by them, cheapens the wages of, uh, cheapens the, uh, the consumer goods consumed by workers. Um, uh, that way, we can kind of get away with uh, um, increasing the rate of exploitation of workers, increase relative surplus value, without decreasing uh, the working class's uh, real wages, the use values um, that they get with their wages. Um, I feel like I could have explained that in a more eloquent way, but just to repeat the sentence that I disagreed with, Marx had argued that technical change is focused on cheapening labor power, on cheapening the goods consumed by workers with their wages. That's It's related to that, but that but formulation is awkward. Anyway, back to the text. Only once does Lenin in any of his work even refer to, quote, relative surplus value, end quote, and then only in providing a summary of volume one of capital. This fact is rather astonishing since the concept is indisputably a major one for Marx, and Lenin is directly concerning himself with the technological development of capitalism. Marx himself does suggest that the extent of the market drives division of labor and specialization, but Marx does not connect technical change to market creation. Footnote. Perhaps Marx would also suggest that division of labor drives the market, as the Volume 3 citation found by Lenin indicates. Um... It's important to like distinguish, I feel like, just as a side note for myself, again, sorry if I'm feeling chatty, but it's import always important to distinguish between social division of labor and division of labor, <laughs> right? Because social division of labor within capitalism is mediated by markets, right? Um, you have one sector that produces food, you have another that produces transport for interest, and the way that the different the labor is divided between those things is mediated via the market, but also within, say, the food sector or the uh, you know transportation sector, there's also a division of labor within the firms located in those branches of industry, right? So there's like, it seems to me like it's always important to like, I don't know, try to keep these terms in check in your writing um, and in your explanations in order to not uh, garnish confusion. Because especially um, if you're talking about division of labor, the social division of labor in like a marketplace, and, um, you know, never mind, I'll, I won't go into that whole bit, but it seems like you could uh, make markets or something like that, a or uh, commodity production as a trans-historical social force, um, if you don't keep the concepts of social division of labor and capitalism and the notion of division of labor as such um, in clear distinction. Let me know if that makes sense. I don't know, maybe it doesn't. I apologize for you having to listen to me draw on, but um, it's my world. I'm the one reading. Anyway, Lenin's focus on market creation as associated with technical progress, including references to the domination of the means of production department, over the means of consumption is simp consumption department is simply that 
Lenin's emphasis. Lenin's focus on the creation as on market creation as associated with technical progress is not Marx's, in spite of what Lenin leads the reader to believe. Lenin wants the argument of increasing specialization of social labor and the increasing role of the market in order to defeat skeptics about the development of capitalism in Russia. Lenin's anti sismondi position, to be discussed in the next section, fits right into the same program. This, is in, this sentence is in italics, so I'm going to read it twice. Lenin underplays the question of coercion in market creation while highlighting the possible role of technical change. Lenin underplays the question of coercion in market creation while highlighting the possible role of technical change. Next section. Actually, I'm going to take a break. <laughs> Sorry. An individualized peasantry? The precondition for Lenin's argument. After restating his theory that the development of capitalism is a necessity because, quote, one social economy is based on the division of labor and the commodity form of the product, Technical progress must inevitably lead to the strengthening and deepening of capitalism, end quote. Lenin's 1893 work offers as the criterion for its, con for its correctness the facts of the Russian rural economy. These facts refer to differentiation of the peasantry into a bourgeoisie and a proletariat, quote, the only explanation of which lies in the laws of commodity economy, which splits our, quote, community, end quote, peasants, end quote. Lenin even says that absent separation of peasant households, commodity production would not have arisen in Russia. Lenin asserts that, quote, each of our peasants conducts his farming separately and independently of his fellows. He carries on the production of products which become his private property at his own exclusive risk. He enters into relation with the, quote, market, end quote, on his own, end quote. Are these statements of separation and individualization factually correct? Waters, in 1968, arguing that the existence of the commune was a major factor in the Russian agrarian crisis, reports data showing for European Russia in 1892 the year before Lenin is writing, that three-quarters of male peasants were working communally-owned land. I'm going to repeat that sentence. Three-quarters of male peasants were working communally-owned land. Even by 1905, less than 5% of peasants worked individually-owned private land. On the largest size plots, however, on an average household basis, while twice that number worked peasant association owned private land and a somewhat smaller number worked communally owned private land. On allotment land, communal tenor applied to some 80%. After considering leased land, Waters concluded that about 43% of all cultivatable, cultivable land was communally controlled, worked by a larger unspecified percentage of the peasantry. To me. After, after, excuse me, I'm going to, I got to repeat that sentence. On allotment land, communal tenor applied to some 80%. After considering leased land, Waters concludes that about 43% of all cultivable land was communally controlled, worked by a larger, unspecified percentage of the peasantry. Much more telling is the work of Miranov, in 1990, who looks closely at the actual functioning of the commune, being mostly, but not entirely, in agriculture, and others in trade, crafts, factories, and innkeeping. While there could be many aspects to discuss, such as the decisive role of the democratic assembly, which, however, excluded women, 
or the commune exceeding in importance the family as a group of reference, crucial for our discussion is the commune's resistance to the very class differentiation Lenin discusses. Indeed, the peasants supported the commune when a movement for land reform developed in the late 1870s, so much so that the statist that statistical analysis within European Russia found that some 89% of peasant households were in communes, whether we are examining 1877 or 1905, exclamation point. I'm going to read that sentence. Since there's an exclamation point at the end of it, it's important, and it seems important um, historically. Indeed, the peasants supported the commune when a movement for land reform developed in the late 1870s, so much so that statistical analysis within, the, within European Russia found that some 89% of peasant households were in communes, whether we are examining 1877 or 1905. In some, quote, the commune was not compatible with an intensive market economy. With significant differentiation in property, culture, and social status. With formal rationality. With a clear expressed individualism. With a constitutional state, end quote. What Waters blames, excuse me, where Waters blames the commune for Russian agrarian backwardness and Miranov explains the commune, Lenin simply ignores the commune. And this doesn't change when Lenin comes to his magnum opus. White, reviewing Lenin's 1899 book in 2001, concluded, concludes that Lenin writes out the existence of community peasants by, quote, classifying the commune as a social or ethnographic phenomenon, bracket, so that, end bracket, the commune, its dynamics, or how communal life influenced the economic situation of the peasantry in the post-reform era, is not discussed. Lenin, for purposes of his book, has abolished the peasant communes and has put atomized civil society in their place, end quote. White. Um, I think he's referring to James D. White. Um, I think he wrote a book about Marxism in the Soviet Union. Um, yeah, it says, this is from the Jacobin website, it says, James D. White is reader in Russian and East European history at the University of Glasgow. His works include Lenin, the Practice and Theory of Revolution, and Red Hamlet, the Life and Ideas of Alexander Bogdanov. So, returning to the commune to returning the commune to the commune's proper place within the Russian peasantry, we have no difficulty understanding the post nineteen o five Stalipin reforms designed to break up the communes and individualize peasant land tenor, while the reforms were undertaken by a terroristic state in which thousands of dissidents were executed, success still was not overwhelming. The history itself shows the strength of communal land. Thus, we can follow Shannon, who, writing in 1983, and White, writing in 1996, and acknowledge that, from afar, Marx was correct to have taken the Russian commune seriously, quite a bit more seriously than did Lenin in St. Petersburg in 1893. I mean, I, he hasn't mentioned his, uh, Marx's letters to Vera S uh, Sosulich. <laughs> but I believe, I can't be positive on this, but I believe Marx's concept of revolution for Russia uh, was uh, steeped in um, building off of um, what uh, pre-existed in the rural commune, the Mir, M-I-R. I'm not exactly sure, though. Two, 
production creates a market for itself, following Ricardo. Quote, Modern, bracket, Marxist, and bracket, theory, accepted his, bracket, Sismondi's, end bracket, references to the contradictions of capitalism, subjected <coughs> them to a scientific analysis, and in, on all points reached conclusions which radically differ from Sismondi's, and for that reason lead to a diametrically opposite point of view concerning capitalism, end quote, Lenin. No political economist preceding Marx received as much direct attention from Lenin as Swiss J.C.L. Sismondi, Simon de Sismondi, Simon de Sismondi. In 1897, Lenin was drawn to analyze his writings, since he says Sismondi's arguments are very similar to the Narodniks in Russia. Lenin undertook a 133-page systematic analysis of Sismondi, who had asserted that a wage, as wage labor develops, quote, production inevitably outruns consumption and is faced with the insoluble task of finding consumers, that it cannot find consumers within the country because it converts the bulk of the population into day laborers, plain workers, and creates unemployment, while the search for a foreign market becomes increasingly difficult owing to the entry of new capitalist countries into the world arena, end quote. As, his dis oh, me, Lenin. As Lenin's discussion progresses, we find Lenin much more critical of Sismondi than of Ricardo. Sismondi does deserve credit, says Lenin, for emphasizing the ruination of the small producer that the classical economists had ignored in the classical economists' theory. However, Sismondi was incorrect in asserting that the, quote, home market, end quote, thereby shrinks. Rather, Marxist theory had established, says Lenin in a five-page discussion, and I agree, that, quote, to the extent that domestic production gives way to production for sale, while the handicraft man is superseded by the factory, a market is created for capital. The, quote, day laborers, end quote, are pushed out of agriculture by the conversion of the, quote, peasants, end quote, into, quote, farmers, end quote, provide labor power for capital, and the farmers are purchasers of the products of industry, not only of articles of consumption, which were formerly produced by the peasants at home, or by village artisans, but also of instruments of production, which could not remain of the old type after small farming had been superseded by large-scale farming, end quote. Lenin. Lenin also objects to Sismondi's position as to whether foreign markets are an avenue out of the realization problem. This discussion takes another five pages, section six of chapter one, and Lenin is here also correct. Whether or not there is a realization problem can be addressed simply within a national setting, with no loss in understanding of the theoretical issues involved. Most of Lenin's attention, however, is focused around understanding accumulation of capital in capitalist society. Sismondi did not understand this, writes Lenin, while Ricardo did. Quote, Ricardo asserted that production creates a market for production's self, whereas Sismondi denied that production creates a market for production's self. Dot, dot, dot. Production does indeed create a market for production's self. Production needs means of production, and means of production constitute a special department of social production. Dot, 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 end quote. That is, the quote, home market, end quote, initially develops within capitalism, 
since means of production are themselves market-based and expanding. In fact, a market for consumption goods is not necessarily a principal concern, since a complete logical separation of increases in the market for means of production for markets for articles of consumption is the point Lenin drives home against Sismondi and against the Narodniks. Quote, and uh, there's a quote within a quote here, quote, quote, consumption, end quote, develops after, quote, accumulation, end quote, or after, quote, production, end quote. Strange though it may seem, it cannot be otherwise in capitalist society. The law of development of capital is that constant capital grows faster than variable capital. Bracket, hence the department producing means of production, end bracket, necessarily grows faster than the department which manufactures articles of consumption, i.e., that take place is what takes place is exactly that which Sismondi declared to be, quote, impossible, quote, dangerous, end quote, etc., end quote. Lenin. Expansion of production is prior to changes in the demand for consumption. Changes due to consumption demands of capitalists, the number of workers employed, or the wage level of workers. As Lenin's argument proceeds, Lenin even concludes, contrary to Sismondi, that accumulation, quote, opens a new market for means of production without correspondingly expanding the market for articles of consumption and even contracting this market, end quote. I'm going to reread that sentence because it's in italics. As Lenin's argument proceeds, Lenin even concludes, contrary to Sismondi, that accumulation, quote, opens a new market for means of production without correspondingly expanding the market for articles of consumption and even contracting this market for articles of consumption, end quote. The demand for consumer goods is derived is a derived demand, derived from the expansion of production, and thus expansion of means of production, due seemingly to technological progress as accumulation takes place. The market for consumer goods may even contract. Before coming to this conclusion, Lenin reminds us, in three sections of his first chapter, inciting Marx, that both Ricardo and Sismondi borrow from Adam Smith the same error of leaving constant capital out of the national product that all of subsequent political economy had. Footnote. Mosley, 1998, I'm assuming he reads, he's referring to Fred Mosley, claims that none of the participants in the debate on Marx's reproduction scheme pointed to Smith's error. He mentions Tugenberinovsky, Hilferding, Luxembourg, and Lenin. Yet, in fact, it was a major point of Lenin's Sismondi work. Luxembourg also spent a chapter on Smith's error, and even Tugen, in the uh, second edition, but not the first, of his well-known book mentioned it. Note that, later, Dunayevskaya thought recognition of this error to be of decisive importance for Marxism, i.e., Marx proved that, quote, the constant portion of capital, bracket, did, end bracket, not, quote, dissolve, end quote, itself into wages. But it became the very instrumentality through which the capitalists gained the mastery over the living worker, end quote. This is, quote, the great divide, not alone, between bourgeois economics and Marxism, but also between petty bourgeois criticism, or utopian socialism, and scientific socialism, end quote, Dunayevskaya. 
Further discussion of Dunayevskaya regarding her reading of Lenin is in Zaremka, 2002. On the other hand, Steedman, leaving aside Smith, argues that Ricardo did not, in fact, make the error repeatedly asserted by Marx. The whole issue seems to be anything but exhausted. End footnote. Attention to this error leads one to expect it to be decisive regarding the accuracy of Ricardo's work. Yet, while still directly referring to Ricardo's error in repeating Smith's, Ricardo is still correct, says Lenin, on the possibilities of capitalist accumulation, while Sismondi is wrong. Yet, while directly referring to Ricardo's error in repeating Smith's, Ricardo is still correct, says Lenin, on the possibilities of capitalist accumulation, while Sismondi is wrong. Where the error itself, excuse me, where the error itself corrected and constant capital included, the quote impossibility end quote of realizing surplus value, a la Sismondi, would allegedly vanish. Ricardo succeeded in correctly understanding accumulation, according to Lenin, error or no error regarding constant capital in national product. Luxembourg, while giving Lenin credit for his seeing the similarity between Narodnik views and those of Sismondi, concludes that Lenin underappreciated Sismondi and overemphasized the significance of Smith's error, continued by both Ricardo and Sismondi. But she does not address how Lenin could reason that Ricardo made the same Smithian error as Sismondi and still understand, supposedly correctly, how production creates in its own market. I think it might be supposed to say creates its own market, but I'm not sure. Might be a typo. Nevertheless, in asserting that expansion of capitalist production creates its own market and that the demand for consumer goods is a derived demand, Lenin is clearly highlighting the capitalist as organizer of production a la Ricardo. To reinforce the point, he is able to recite Marx on the necessity to include constant capital in the value of national product constant capital precisely being the value represented in means of production. By doubly focusing on production, Lenin shifts attention away from a special concern with problems of realization, to which we now turn. <clears throat> Section 3. Crises arising from disproportionalities. Modifying Tugen, admirer of Say, quote, extensive ac extracts from bracket Lenin's writings on the problem of realization and bracket are usually appended to editions of capital, apparently to serve as a kind of official exegesis of Marx's work. This practice began in the 1930s, dot, 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 end quote. And what was happening in the 1930s? Stalinism. In the section on, quote, crisis, end quote, in his Sismondi work, Lenin distinguishes two theories of crisis in capitalism. The first, borrowed from Smith and Robertus, and ascribed to Sismondi, explains crises by contradiction between production and consumption of the working class by under-consumption. The second, the Marxist one, explains crises, quote, by another contradiction, namely the contradiction between the social character of production, socialized by capitalism, and the private individual character of appropriation, end quote. By the anarchy of production. Lenin. The first, quote, sees the root of the phenomenon outside of production. 
The latter sees it precisely in the conditions of production, end quote. Lenin does not deny underconsumption, but rather says that Marx's theory allows us to understand the, quote, more profound, end quote, contradiction, the anarchy of capitalist production. Clearly, theorizing production, does Lenin's interpretation correspond to Marx's understanding of crises? I begin with an often cited passage from Capital Volume 3 regarding realization. Marx is discussing the falling tendency of the rate of profit. Volume 3, we may remember, had been published three years prior to Lenin's, Lenin's writing on Sismondi. After remarking that products replacing both constant and variable capital, um, constant, var constant capital, if you don't know, um, being uh, <sighs> means of production capital, and variable capital referring to uh, the capital spent on the wage. After remarking, remarking that products replacing both constant and variable capital, as well as products representing surplus value, must be sold. Marx recalls that, on the one hand, Conditions of direct exploitation are only limited by productive powers, while on the other hand, conditions of realization are limited by, quote, this is a big quote from Marx, the proportional relations of the various branches of production and the consumer power of society. But this last name is not determined either by the absolute productive power or by the absolute consumer power, but by the consumer power based on antagonistic conditions of distribution, which reduce the consumption of the bulk of society to a mini minimum, varying within more or less narrow limits. Consumer power of society is furthermore restricted by the tendency to accumulate, to drive the drive to expand capital and produce surplus value on an extended scale. Dot, dot, dot. The market must, therefore, be continually extended. Dot, dot, dot. This internal contradiction seeks to resolve this internal contradiction self through expansion of the outlying field of production. But the more productiveness develops, the more productiveness finds itself at variance with the narrow basis on which the conditions of consumption rest, end quote. Marx. I'm assuming that, yeah, that's from volume, capital volume three. Clearly, for Marx, the two elements of realizing surplus value and therefore of crises, are, quote, the proportional relation of the various branches of production, end quote, end quote, the consumer power of society, end quote. A discrepancy between production and consumption is not described by Marx as pertaining only to what Lenin characterizes as, quote, one department of the whole capitalist production, end quote. It is rather a property of the whole. Mikhail von Tugenbernowski studied the theories of economic crises in both the classical economists and Marx. Citing the preceding passage from Marx in 1898, Tugen drew the conclusion that there are inconsistencies in Marx, seemingly at variance with Volume 2, Tugin was disturbed that the Volume 3 passage says the products, quote, may not find a market, even if the di distribution of production is proportional. This is apparently the meaning of the above-quoted words of Marx, end quote. That's from Tugin Baranovsky's uh, Capitalism in the Market, as cited by Lenin in 1899. 
Tugin cited Marx's Volume 3 passage in order to object to object to the splitting of the causes of crises into two elements, and in order to promote a disproportionality interpretation of crisis. The next year, Lenin replied to Tugin that, for Marx, quote, the consumer power of society, excuse me, here's a quote and a quote here, I missed it. The next, the next year, Lenin replied to Tugin Baranovsky that, for Marx, quote, quote, the consumer power of society, end quote, and the, quote, proportional realization of various branches of production, end quote, these are not conditions that are isolated, independent of, and unconnected with each other. On the contrary, a definite condition of consumption is one of the elements of proportionality, end quote, Lenin. In other words, where Tugin attempted to show inconsistencies between Capital Volume 3 and Capital Volume 2, Lenin is subsuming consumption conditions under proportionalities, i.e. Lenin is attempting to bring his reading of Volume 3 into consonance with Part 3 of Volume 2, e.g., quote, there is an explanation, bracket, in volume 3, and bracket, of how and to what extent the realization of constant capital is, quote, independent, end quote, of individual consumption, end quote. I'm going to reread that last sentence because there's italics in it. In other words, where Tugin attempted to show inconsistencies between volume 3 and volume 2, Lenin is subsuming consumption conditions under proportionalities, i.e., Lenin is attempting to bring his reading of Volume 3 into consonance with Part 3 of Volume 2, e.g., quote, there is an explanation, bracket, in Volume 3, end bracket, of how and to what extent the realization of constant capital is, quote, independent, end quote, of individual consumption, end quote. In 1901, Tugin seems to take account of Lenin's reaction. In fact, Tugin even subscribes to a rolling of issues of consumption into questions of proportionality, leaving only their respective interpretations of Marx's own intentions to differentiate them. Tugin considers himself a supporter of the doctrine he ascribes to, say, James Mill, John Stuart Mill, and Ricardo that, quote, given a proportional distribution of social production, supply and demand must coincide, end quote. For Tugin, therefore, quote, when Marx opposes the lack of proportionality to the deficiency of social consumption as two independent causes of stagnation, Marx acknowledges being a follower of Sismondi's underconsumptionist theory, end quote. Rozdalsky, after examining Tugin's work as well as Bulgakov's similar position and Engel's debate with Danielson, I don't know why I read the name Danielson, but um, a million times, but just now, thinking of <coughs> the Karate Kid, Danielson. Rozdalski, after examining Tugin's work as well as Bulgakov's similar position and Engel's debate with Danielson, elaborates the considerable problems Lenin has in trying to postulate that the problem of disproportionalities encompasses the full issue of understanding capitalist crises. Rozdalski concludes that Lenin, in the process of his attempting, attempted explanation, he gets, quote, uncomfortably close to Bulgakov's and Tugin's, quote, disproportionality, end quote, theory of crises, end quote. Even as, in an 1899 article on Struva, Lenin seemingly contradicts his earlier position of subsuming the issue of limited worker consumption under disproportionality theory. Footnote. Quote, Marxist theory showed how, 
the tremendous growth of production is definitely not accompanied by a corresponding growth in people's consumption. Marx's theory, dot dot dot, provides a most powerful weapon against bourgeois apologetics. It follows from the theory that even with an ideally smooth and proportional reproduction and circulation of the aggregate social capital, the contradiction between the growth of production and the narrow limits of consumption is inevitable, end quote. Lenin. This article is written only a few months after his article on Tugin, yet this language implicitly now supports Tugin's reading of Marx, that there are indeed two theories of crisis in Marx. Rozdowski also concludes that Lenin's misreading of Marx conditions his subsequent rejection of Luxembourg's The Accumulation of Capital and his pointed use of two Austro-Marxists against Luxembourg. Rozdowski adds that Lenin's greatest deficiency is in thinking that the schemes of reproduction are themselves sufficient to understand the issue of realization. Rozdowski also reminds us of Plekhanov's 1905 interpretation of Lenin's position, thereby showing that a major Marxist, before Luxembourg, had noted the similarity of Lenin's theoretical position to Tugin Baranovsky's, quote, The real father of this by no means new doctrine, bracket, of the impossibility of overproduction, end bracket, was Jean-Baptiste Say. Dot, dot, dot. Besides, Tugin, Mr. Tugin Baranovsky, Mr. Vladimir Ilyin, bracket Lenin, end bracket, also professed the theory of Jean Baptiste Say. End quote. Neither were others at that time taken in by an argument based on the supremacy of proportionality concerns. Schmidt in 1901 and Kautsky in, and Kautsky in 1902 reviewed Tugenberinovsky's 1901 book. <coughs> Schmidt said that, quote, Consumption demand is the enlivening force which, throughout the entire economy, keeps the huge apparatus of production in motion, end quote. Kautsky's review extended over four issues of Die Neue Zeit, divided into five sections, and says that, quote, in the final analysis, dot, 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 the extension of human consumption exercises the decisive influence over the expansion of production. Production is and remains production for human consumption, end quote. Lenin's position, in fact, was an uncommon one at best. Sweezy, however, it says, see Sweezy. Um, Sweezy, however, took Lenin's side, it says here. Lest one think that this is the end of the story... Much later, Lenin did have another opportunity to distance himself from Tugen-style thought. Lenin had read and studied Hilferding's Finance Capital, and by and large gave the work favorable commentary in his imperialism. Yet Hilferding, in the main, adopts the Tugen-type disproportionality theory of crisis. Subsection, or next section, or whatever, yeah, subheading. Crisis arises from overproduction. Marx prefers Sisman D, who affirms it, to Ricardo, who denies it. Does Lenin subordinating the underconsumption to capitalist anarchy, with the re with relevant passages in the second volume of Theories of Surplus Value? Excuse me. Does Lenin subordinating underconsumption to capitalist anarchy? 
square with relevant passages in the second volume of Theories of Surplus Value, where Marx devotes considerable attention to Ricardo's views on the dynamics of capitalism. No. Contra Lenin, Marx is quite critical of Ricardo regarding overproduction. Saying elsewhere, as we shall see, the Sismondi regarding capitalist contradictions was, quote, epoch-making in political economy, end quote. While Ricardo's error following Smith's error of excluding constant capital from the value of a product is mentioned in Marx's first few pages and again later, yet more than 40 pages are devoted to argumentation by Marx regarding overproduction without returning to Smith's error. Marx says that the conception of Ricardo, adopted from, say, that overproduction is impossible, is based upon seeing products as being exchanged against products, rather than understanding capitalist production as concerned with the expansion of surplus value. Crises are, quote, reasoned out of existence here by forgetting or denying the first elements of capitalist production, the existence of the product as a commodity, the duplication of the commodity in commodity and money, the consequent separation which takes place in the exchange of commodities, and finally the relation of money or commodities to wage labor, end quote. Indeed, says Marx, a person may sell simply driven by a need to pay. There's some italics there, so I'll read it again. Indeed, says Marx, a person may sell simply driven by a need to pay. Quote, the immediate purpose of capitalist production is not, quote, the possession of other goods, end quote, but the appropriation of value, of money, of abstract wealth, end quote, Marx. The assertion by Ricardo that there may be a glut of a particular commodity, but not a general glut, is simply based upon James Mill's, quote, metaphysical equilibrium of purchases and sales, end quote. Those later economists after Ricardo who argued for overabundance of capital, but not overproduction of commodities, actually represented an advance over Ricardo, who had followed, say, and denied both. The overabundant, or, um, I guess both being what? Argued for over, excuse me, author, I'll just read the sentence when I'm done. At least these economists were envisioning capitalists confronting each other as such, rather than simply as owners of commodities. Those later economists, after Ricardo, who argued for overabundance of capital, but not overproduction of commodities, actually represented an advance over Ricardo, who had followed, say, and denied the overabundance of capital, and the overproduction of commodities, at least these economists were envisioning capitalists confronting each other as capitalists, rather than simply as owners of commodities. In sum, according to Marx, what Ricardo fails to understand is that the law of capital is, quote, to exploit the maximum amount of labor with the given amount of capital, without any consideration for the actual limits of the market, or the needs backed by the ability to pay. And this is carried out through continuous expansion of reproduction and accumulation, and therefore constant reconversion of revenue into capital. But on the other hand, the mass of producers remain tied to the average level of needs, and must remain tied to the average level of needs, according to the nature of capitalist production. End quote. Marx. This is in italics right here, so I'm going to read it twice. Ricardo, in the light of Marx's critique, is revealed to lack an understanding of the specific character of capitalist production and circulation.
Ricardo, in the light of Marx's critique, is revealed to lack an understanding of the specific character of capitalist production and circulation. Subsuming realization problems due to deficiencies of consumption under issues of disproportionalities in production, as Lenin proposed, can hardly be argued to have been Marx's position. Marx had read Sismondi carefully and had cited Sismondi rather frequently. Unfortunately, Marx never undertook a systematic critique of Sismondi, although such a study was indicated. Footnote. Students of Marx would not have known this definitively until the first edition of the third and last part of Theories of Surplus Value was finally published in, two th me, in 1910, or perhaps even until the Grundrisse appeared in 1939, to 41. End footnote. In any case, Marx indicates an appreciation of Sismondi, which is not match matched by Lenin's discussion. Thus, a decade after the Communist Manifesto, where Sismondi was mentioned, and characterizes head of a school of petty bourgeois socialism, the Grundrisse offers an assessment regarding the relation of production and consumption, particularly noting the distinction between Ricardo and Sismondi. Quote, the whole dispute as to whether overproduction is possible and necessary in capitalist production revolves around the point whether the process of the realization of capital within production, directly posits its realization in circulation, dot, 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 bracket, Ricardo, end bracket, conceives the overcoming of such barriers, bracket, in circulation, end bracket, as being the essence in the essence of capital, dot, 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 while Sismondi, by contrast, emphasizes not only the encounter with the barriers, but the barriers creation by capital itself and has a vague intuition that they must lead to its breakdown, dot, dot, dot. Ricardo and his entire school never understood the really modern crises in which this contradiction of capital discharges itself in great thunderstorms and which increasingly threaten capital as the foundation of society and of production itself. End quote. Marx. Grundrisse. The most comprehensive statement that Marx made regarding Sismondi, a passage that Lenin did not have available when writing in the 1890s, but which Ricardo did have incited. Excuse me. What am I saying? The most comprehensive statement that Marx made regarding Sismondi a passage that Lenin did not have available when writing in the 1890s, but which Luxembourg did have and cited in 1913, accumulation of capital, was written a half decade after the Grundrisse, published in Part 3 of Theories of Surplus Value in a chapter on Malthus. The passage suggests Marx's respect. Quote, Sisman D., is profoundly conscious of the contradictions in capitalist production, dot, dot, dot. Sismondi is particularly aware of the fundamental contradiction. On the one hand, unrestricted development of the productive forces and wealth, which at the same time consist of commodities and must be turned into cash. On the other hand, the system is based on the fact that the mass of producers is restricted to the necessities. Hence, according to Sisman D, crises are not accidental, as Ricardo maintains, but essential outbreaks, occurring on a large scale and at definite periods of the imminent contradictions, end quote. Marx. Theories of Surplus Value, Part 3. Marx continues further with further discussion of Sismondi 
in his next chapter on the, quote, disintegration of the Ricardian school, end quote, which begins with James Mill. Marx notes that, quote, bourgeois production is compelled by bourgeois production's own imminent laws, on the one hand to develop the productive forces as if production did not take place on a narrow restricted social foundation, while on the other hand, bourgeois production can develop these forces only within these narrow limits, is the deepest and most hidden cause of crises, dot dot dot, end quote. Marx immediately adds that this cause, quote, is grasped rather crudely, but not nonetheless correctly, by Sismondi. For example, as a contradiction between production for the sake of production and distribution which makes absolute development of productivity impossible, end quote. Marx. In other words, it is to Sismondi, not Ricardo, to whom Marx points as having a correct understanding of the, quote, fundamental contradiction, end quote, end quote, deepest, end quote, cause of crises. That's all in italics. I'll read again. In other words, it is to Sismondi, not Ricardo, to whom Marx points as having a correct understanding of the, quote, fundamental contradiction, end quote, end quote, deepest, end quote, cause of crises. Later, Marx even notes that Sisman D, with his awareness of the contradiction between the poverty of the workers and the wealth of the capitalist, was, quote, epoch-making in political economy, end quote. Footnote, Grossman, 1924 also cites this awareness of Sismondi by Marx. Yet, by 1934, Grossman's views on Sismondi are indistinguishable from Lenin's critical views. Grossman now says that, quote, since the outbreak of the present world crisis, this underconsumption theory, which Lenin justly attacked as non-Marxist, has become the official doctrine of numerous socialist parties and trade unions in Europe and America, end quote. There are other references to Sismondi and Marx that suggest limits to Marx's appreciation. In Volume 2, regarding Smith's neglect of constant capital in the, value of in the value of a product, Marx comments that Sismondi made no contribution to solving that problem. But a couple of pages earlier, Marx notes the same deficiency in Ricardo. Lenin cites Marx's criticism of Sismondi, but not of Ricardo. In Theories of Surplus Value Part 2, in a passage that raises a number of other questions, Marx notes that Ricardo in his time, quote, wants production for the sake of production, and this with good reason, bracket, since it, end bracket, means nothing but the development of the human productive forces. In other words, the development of the richness of human nature as an end in itself. To oppose the welfare of the individual to this end, as Sismondi does, is to assert that the development of the species must be arrested. Dot, 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 end quote. I'm going to repeat that because there's uh, italics in it. Um, in Theories of Surplus Value, Part 2, in a passage that raises a number of other questions, Marx notes that Ricardo, in Ricardo's time, quote, wants production for the sake of production, and this with good reason, bracket, since it, end bracket, means nothing but the development of human productive forces. In other words, the development of the richness of human nature as an end in itself. To oppose the welfare of the individual to this end, as Sismondi does, is to assert that the development of the species must be arrested, dot, 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 end quote. End footnote. 
Section 4. Accumulation of Capital. Surplus value is used for, quote, new production, end quote. Lenin, in 1913's, three, quote, three sources, end quote, of Marxism article, is the one place we find an explicit assessment by Lenin of the contribution Marx made relative to the classical economists. All volumes of theories of surplus value had been published by 1910, so Lenin had Marx's views on the classical economist available to him. Adam Smith and David Ricardo are here given credit for the labor theory of value. Lenin, however, describes surplus value as the, quote, cornerstone, end quote, of Marx's theory, and clearly recognizes the importance for Marx of the notion of labor power as a commodity. Quote, where the bourgeois economists saw a relation between things, the exchange of one commodity for another, Marx revealed a relationship between people, end quote. The year afterwards, Lenin, 1914, had an occasion to discuss value theory when considering the, the writings of the liberal political economists, econ liberal political economists, plural, particularly Struve. Struve had argued that Marx had, quote, turned labor value not only into a law, but also into the, quote, substance, end quote, of price, dot, 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 and culminates in a colossal and hopeless contradiction, end quote. Lenin answers Struva's attempt to demolish value as the substance of price by saying that Struva's argument is nonsense, for reasons which need not detain our discussion, and that there is no contradiction between volumes 1 and 3 of capital and value and the formation of average prices. For Struva to speak of the independence of value and price is a, quote, mockery of science, end quote. Lenin. In 1915, Lenin wrote a survey of Marx's political economy, much of which is quite accurate. However, when studying Sismondi in 1897, Lenin had written that accumulation is, quote, the excess of production over revenue, articles of consumption, end quote, and that to accumulate, quote, in the categorical meaning of the term, end quote, is to expand production. Now, Lenin repeats the same point, saying that, quote, new and important in the highest degree is Marx's analysis of the accumulation of capital, i.e., the transformation of a part of surplus value into capital, and its use not for satisfying the personal needs or whims of the capitalist, but for new production, end quote. In other words, Lenin's interpretation of, quote, accumulation of capital, end quote, drives toward increased production. I'm going to reread -read that sentence. In other words, Lenin's interpretation of, quote, accumulation of capital, end quote, drives toward increased production. This formulation simply cannot be found in Marx, where surplus value is converted into capital, but that capital is not then described as, quote, new production, end quote. Indeed, at one crucial point summarizing prior discussion, Marx describes accumulation of capital as increase of the proletariat. Lenin's interpretation also fails to mention any increased exploitation of workers. This entire issue is elaborated upon in Zarembka 2000, 
particularly pages 190 to 191 and section 2, and is connected to Lenin's dismissal of Luxembourg's accumulation of capital, which is arguably closer to Marx, even as that text is critical of Marx's schemes of reproduction. Section 5. Conclusion. Lenin as Economist of Production. We have seen that there is only one substantive criticism of Ricardo in Lenin's 1897 work on Sismondi, i.e., Ricardo's following of Adam Smith in forgetting to include constant capital in the value of the national product. Lenin's 1893 earlier article does not touch at all on Ricardo. His development of capitalism in Russia only mentions Ricardo twice, restating that error cited in 1897. There are a couple of other suggestions of disagreement with Ricardo in other economic works of Lenin, e.g., on the failure to recognize absolute ground rent, but they are not pointed or elaborated. Of course, Marx's lengthy discussion of Ricardo was first published only in 1905, when part two of Theories of Surplus Value appeared. Yet Lenin had this available for the second editions of his Sismondi article and of his book, both in 1908, and neither included significant changes. A justification could be offered that is an accident of the topics he worked on, that Lenin had few clear occasions to make thrust at Ricardo, in spite of his extensive work in economics and the Russian economy in the 1890s. Still, why was the, quote, petite bourgeois, end quote, Sisman D deserving of so much critical attention and commentary, but not the, quote, bourgeois, end quote, Ricardo? Is instrumentality in opposing neurotism justification? I suggest, rather, that Lenin's relative silence regarding Ricardo is symptomatic of his larger understanding, an understanding that represents a step backwards from Marx's. Of course, Lenin does write that labor power is a commodity and does recognize the importance thereby of class relations in production. Ricardo and other classical economists do not. But consider Lenin's neglect of coercion in market expansion and is fair to use Marx's concept of the production of relative surplus value, using instead his own interpretation of technical change as itself market creating and driven by competition, an interpretation having antecedents in Smith. Recall his biting criticism of Sismondi, the extent of which cannot be supported by a reading of capital. Excuse me, by a reading of Marx. Consider Lenin's distortion of Marx by emphasizing disproportionalities in production for understanding crises in capitalism, an emphasis that has its own classical antecedents, particularly in Say and accepted by Ricardo. Note Lenin's presentation in 1915 of the meaning of, for Marx of accumulation of capital as, quote, new production, end quote. There is also another, there is also other evidence that can be included. In 1913 and 1914, Lenin analyzed Taylorism, and his focus was decidedly upon increasing production. Not upon the active role of workers in technology, nor upon the consequences for workers of Taylor's supposed increased separation between mental and manual labor, or of the bureaucratization of the workplace. Parenthesis, Linhart, 1976, offers a careful discussion of Lenin and Taylorism, including the period after 1917. Um, yeah, if you, read, if you watch the uh, video of Stephen A. Smith, uh, one of the best uh, scholars on global communism, um, he basically, he talks about how, like, you know, talks about, like, Lenin in, like, 1917, and how, 
like basically the core of Lenin's uh, belief system um, with you know deviations here and there, his ultimate uh, vision, um, his ultimate understanding of Russia was that um, uh, that it was uh, economically backwards and what ne was needed was an intensification of productivity um, and uh, industrialization. And if that included um, exploitative uh, labor relations, if that entailed hierarchy at sites of production, um, so be it. It's basically what he said was like, you know, you could, well, at least he said you could argue that was kind of Lenin's entire uh, disposition to the question of the uh, social relations of Russia was this kind of um, ultra productivist uh, understanding of uh, what needed to be done in Russia. And it, that would be reflected in um, uh, in his politics and the politics of Bolshevism generally. Uh, you know, he, uh, what was I going to say? He says that, like, there's not, he was basically says, like, there's not just that element in Lenin, but, um, it's, um, probably the dominant one. Um, and that's kind of guided, and that's kind of like, you know, and sorry, just a, as a priest pause, um, this critique of, uh, Lenin and the Bolshevik in general's, uh, attitude towards production and their attitude towards industrialization, um, their, that, that whole, uh, their whole attitude towards techniques, um, modernization, uh, that kind of thing, kind of, um, I think is a very, I think, understanding their attitudes to that. Sorry, I'm, I'm just rambling at this point. I've been reading too long. But that's kind of what Castoriadis comes to say is like the core of like the entire project where it goes off of like revolution goes off the rails is that there's this kind of contradiction between human emancipation on the one hand, which is like the uh, goal of revolution. And on the other, this kind of like uh, abstract deification of production of factory on factory on factory on increased productivity as if these increases in productivity had no uh, authoritarian social consequences, exploitative social consequences, and so on. So, um, I think a large, I think some of the best critiques of Leninism uh, come from a critique of uh, technicism. Um, and I think that, uh, I'm not even thinking. Anyway. <sighs> Where am I? Immediately after the October Revolution in a country impoverished by World War I, Lenin's first emphasis was upon accounting and control by workers and peasants. Given that, quote, there is enough bread, iron, timber, wool, cotton, and flax in Russia to satisfy the needs of everyone if only labor and labor's products are properly distributed, end quote. This seems unobjectionable, until Lenin describes proposing this practice as the essence of socialist transformation, and suggests implementing it through competition, with a variety of methods being used by the communes themselves, perhaps including that, quote, one out of every ten idlers will be shot on the spot, end quote. Lenin, 1918. As civil war turns towards victory, Lenin speaks to the Russian Young Communist League that the basis of communist society is electricity, and that, quote, only after electrification of the entire country, of all branches of industry and agriculture, dot, 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 will you be able to build for yourselves the communist society, end quote. The NEP period did not change this emphasis upon electrification. The reasoning is quite remarkable, not least in considering that Marx wrote without the benefit of electricity. <laughs> Time after time, Lenin offers an interpretation of Marxist political economy 
that connects in one way or another to issues of production and is not dissimilar to Ricardo's emphasis on production even when the bourgeoisie could be at the short end of the stick. Marx had said regarding Ricardo that where, quote, the bourgeois comes into conflict with, bracket, production of the productive development of human labor, end quote, he is just as ruthless towards it as he is at other times toward the proletariat and the aristocracy, end quote. Marx on Ricardo. I'm going to repeat that. That actually seems important. Marx had said regarding Ricardo that where, quote, the bourgeois comes into conflict with, bracket, production or the productive development of human labor, end bracket, Ricardo is just as ruthless towards it as Ricardo is at other times toward the proletariat and the aristocracy, end quote. Marx, could not a simple rewording apply to Lenin? Yeah, <laughs> that's that's fucking genius. Um, oh shit, there's a footnote here. Communal justice could include death for arsonists, robbers, and horse thieves. What just what definition of quote justice end quote? would include random executions for idlers. <clears throat> anyway, back to the text. If Ricardo can be critical of any social class, when not developing production, could not the same be said of Lenin's focus? Was Lenin's attack on the Narodniks and Sismondi, Lenin's criticism of Luxembourg's political economy, Lenin's support of Taylorism, Lenin's emphasis upon accounting and control, and upon electrification, not a reflection of Lenin's political economy? At the time of the writing we have discussed, Lenin's political economy was not dominant within Marxist circles. The 1893 article was not even in print until 1937. Lenin took his positions, others took their positions. There was controversy. On an issue such as overproduction, Lenin was in a minority. Lenin's importance at the time of these writings should not be overestimated and could simply be considered part of healthy debate. Yet the revolutionary success of 1917 gave Lenin's political economy an imprimatur much beyond Lenin's political economy's actual intellectual weight. So in 1922, when Lenin said of Luxembourg's accumulation that Luxembourg, quote, was mistaken on the theory of the accumulation of capital, end quote, repeating an earlier comment regarding, quote, her incorrect interpretation of Marx's theory, end quote, it must be so. As Stalinism deepened, defending Luxembourg against Lenin turned into heresy. If history is written by the victorious, so, it seems, can social theory. Regarding the connection of Lenin's political economy to the later development of Marxist theory and to Marxist practice, whether of Lenin himself or of others, the matter becomes more complicated and will require separate investigation. The End <laughs>